So the question is, uh, freeze all for all, or in other words, should we still perform fresh embryo transfers? Because in the ideal world, uh, you, we have uh, we have seen Alberto with 80% of freeze all cycles because of the PGT uh, analysis in some of your center it's also a lot of uh, freeze all cycles today we are uh, vitrifying all our embryos on day three and preferably on day five at the blastocyst stage with a survival rate or of 95 maybe 98 percent so we should not be afraid anymore of freezing all the thing is and it's again blocked to alessandro no uh, the thing is that when we compare fresh versus uh, uh, frozen cycles, that in high responder patients and PCOS patients, pregnancy rates will be higher in freeze all, low risk of OHSS. In normal responder patients, there is at least a similar outcome. So what is preventing us? Maybe, as you can see, the longer time to pregnancy in a freeze all strategy, the time to pregnancy is a bit prolonged, but we will discuss that immediately. This is the only trial that has a negative outcome. And it was the Dutch colleagues, uh, the, the group of Mastenbroek from uh, the Netherlands, who was comparing fresh versus freeze. And they came to the conclusion that the in the freeze all setting, there was significantly less, or, yeah, significantly less pregnancies as compared with uh, the fresh cycles but if you look and you don't need to look very carefully but look at the numbers first of all we we are talking about 200 patients in total but not only that look at the cumulative ongoing pregnancy rates 19 percent in a freeze-all setting we are talking about normal responders i think maybe they should revise their vitrification program Yes, I think you agree. There was a lot of criticism to that publication published in Human Reproduction. Time to pregnancy. One of the major outcome measures beside of the cumulative live birth rate, time to pregnancy after a freeze-all cycle. So the first question is, having uh, after the um, ovarian stimulation cycle, should we wait before uh, going to the frozen embryo transfer or should we not delay and can we immediately uh, proceed to the preparation of the frozen embryo transfer? Well, when Samuel Santos Ribeiro from Lisbon now, he used to be with us in, uh, in, in Brussels, he did two uh, analyses, one after a failed fresh and one after a freeze-all strategy. And we came to the conclusion that actually, whether we do a delayed start or an immediate start, that it was completely the same and even a higher uh, number of pregnancies when you do an immediate embryo transfer. So the time to pregnancy is already shortened if you do not delay. There is even this uh, large uh, meta-analysis, not only uh, prospective trials included, showing the same thing, even a higher ongoing pregnancy rate and live birth rate when you perform your frozen embryo transfer immediately after the freeze all strategy. Time to pregnancy, again, because you have triggered your patient with an agonist, you do your oocyte retrieval, the patient starts bleeding five to six days after oocyte retrieval, and then you start with the preparation. Preparation here in this study of Annalisa Raka, who is now in Italy, when she was with us, she said, well, let us compare one week of preparation versus two weeks of preparation with E2. One week of preparation, and then uh, in case of an endometrial thickness of seven millimeters and more, then we start with the progesterone versus the classical approach of two weeks. What was the result? completely the same. So this, first of all, offers possibilities in scheduling, whether it is still ethical to prescribe an artificial cycle, that's another question. But in case we need an artificially prepared cycle, we can give seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 days of preparation, which offers, of course, 
a tool again to avoid uh, the weekends because in our hands again if we have more than 25 frozen embryo transfers uh, per day then the lab director is not so happy with us there is um elective and non-elective indications for the the freeze all we are not going uh, through all of them uh, so the non-elective indications is ohss elevated progesterone and so on and you also have the elective uh, freeze alls uh, pgt oci donation and and uh, and so on ohss ohss is still enemy number one in reproductive medicine. Let us not forget this, because these are the number, the very small number of cases that are reported by the clinics in the UK. But as compared with this um, admissions in the hospital, it is completely different. So we, we are also in our unit, we are quite fighting against the um, a, a good um, uh, reporting of uh, um, complications such as uh, ovarian torsion and so on. We, we always have tendency to forget to forget to mention our uh, uh, reportings of complications. But if you see this uh, difference, OHSS is still an issue that we should tackle. And we have the tools, ladies and gentlemen. We can segment our ovarian stimulation cycle. We published that already many years ago, together with my, my scientific father, uh, uh, Paul De Vruy, who at that time, uh, in 2011, sorry, I forgot to mention the year, in 2011, we created the so-called OHSS free uh, clinic. When should we apply a freeze all strategy or in other words when should we trigger with a grh agonist in an antagonist setting well these data based on a data set of more than 2400 cycles with a very acceptable sensitivity and specific specificity told us that as soon as you develop 19 follicles or more of 11 millimeters or more we can predict OHSS. So please, this is also what we adopted in our setting. As soon as you develop 19 follicles of 11 millimeters or more, regardless of the E2 level, which is much less predictive in terms of assessing or predicting OHSS, much less predictive E2 than the number of follicles, then we trigger with an agonist. And after agonist triggering, ladies and gentlemen, you see that if there is no luteal phase support, OHSS will be practically excluded. Of course, we also published a case report. There are several case reports of OHSS after agonist trigger, which is extremely bizarre because the drastic luteal lysis that you create with your, your agonist, and you have all performed ultrasound scans just the moment before the oocyte retrieval, the ovaries are like this, and then a couple of days after oocyte retrieval, uh, back to normal circumstances. So bizarre how it still can happen in extremely rare circumstances the uh, OHSS after agonist uh, trigger. What about the dose? And it was the question. Well, there's two studies. We have an, uh, a prospective uh, study. We have a, a retrospective uh, analysis um, by um, by the group of, of Vietnam and by the, the, the group of, of Kolibianakis stating that whether we use 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 milligrams that the number of oocytes, the number of mature oocytes, the number of fertilized oocytes, and the number of blastocysts will be the same. So actually, we can choose the dose. If a patient calls in emergency, I only injected 0 0.1 milligrams instead of 0 0.2, no worries. Let's just proceed with the oocyte uh, retrieval. No worries there. And I would like to show you our... Uh, RCT that we performed uh, two years ago, in which we randomized high responder patients into the freeze all versus fresh. So patients were randomized on the day of trigger. So per definition, they developed 19 follicles of 11 millimeters or more on the day of trigger. And then we randomized them into agonist, of course, agonist trigger, and then the 
um, so-called Humayden protocol, which means that you inject one single injection of ATG 1,500 units one hour after retrieval, or in the other arm, agonist trigger, pick up and freeze all strategy, and then the frozen embryo transfer cycle. So we randomized these uh, two uh, groups, triggered by a GRH agonist, and yeah, obviously we had a lot of oocytes in both arms, uh, a similar number of, uh, of oocytes. These are the baseline characteristics. And the results were quite, well, nice to see. So the clinical pregnancy rate was the primary endpoint. And as you can observe, there was a non-significant increase of 6% in favor of the freeze-all strategy. And although this is statistically not significant, for us, it is clinically relevant. And based on these data, we stopped using the so-called Humayden protocol, which excludes ATG to trigger and reintroduces ATG to support the luteal phase because it can still give, ladies and gentlemen, OHSS. And this is another very important uh, marker. There were still a couple of cases with moderate to severe OHSS in the fresh arm as compared to the frozen arm. So let us be, or let us end the discussion about freeze all strategy in terms of preventing uh, OHSS. Another strategy is the progestin-primed ovarian stimulation. The name of progestin-primed ovarian stimulation is maybe not ideal, but it offers a lot of possibilities in patients who are undergoing elective freeze-all. For example, PGT, oocyte and embryo accumulation. We heard uh, the uh, dual stimulation strategy of, uh, of our colleague Alberto. So PPOS, of course, can offer us a lot of, uh, of possibilities. This is a... Que uh... fai? Que fai, Carlo? Prego. So the PPOS uh, protocol in, in OSI donors, what do we know about it? Well, there is a, the, the study, the RCT, medroxyprogesterone acetate versus antagonist, in, an, uh, in a randomized setting, 300 patients were, uh, were randomized, and actually there was a comparable number of oocytes in both groups of the um of the stimulation or of the of the study both groups of the of the study but also we, we don't have reproductive outcomes so maybe a bit early here to draw major uh, conclusions so reproductive outcomes uh, to be uh, continued however we have a study not randomized this time a prospective study where it was looking at the uh, the embryo euploidy rates in the PPOS uh, setting. And there also, the comparison between conventional ovarian stimulation using the antagonist versus the PPOS protocol did not hinder any euploidy rates. So that was quite uh, promising to see. And then talking about the... Uh, PPOS protocol, it bridges easily towards the random start of ovarian stimulation because recently in RBM Online, Barish Atta also stated, why should we still bother about the start of the ovarian stimulation? Why should we still stick to the day two, day three, maybe day four start of stimulation? We can start in the early follicular phase we can start in the late follicular phase, given the two or even three wave strategy of follicular genesis, and we can even start in the luteal phase support. So let us have a look at the random start of ovarian stimulation when starting in the late follicular phase. Starting in the late follicular phase on day 10, maybe day 12, if you wish. Um, there will be a spontaneous ovulation a couple of days later, which is, of course, extremely interesting because it produces endogenous progesterone and there is no need anymore for any 
suppressive analog. There is no need for PPOS. There is no need for a GnRH antagonist. So in cases of elective freeze-all, this offers certainly uh, a uh, possibility. A second strategy is in the luteal phase. So after the, um, the ovulation, we can start on day 16, day 17, day 18, or day 19, if you wish, with the uh, ovarian stimulation. Actually, if you hammer your patients with enough FSH, you can start at any day of the cycle. Here is, of course, the question. Since the endogenous progesterone will lower by the end of the stimulation, probably you might need to add some dihydrogesterone, some MVP, some MPA, or or uh, the antagonist before triggering with the GNRH agonist and retrieving your uh, oocytes. So this remains a question: when to introduce the uh, analog or the progesterone? The random start, as you are very well aware comes from the cancer patients. Cancer patients, they need to start with their treatment uh, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, or in two weeks. And then we have uh, in our center a kind of individualized protocol. Do we have time to stimulate them and, and to wait? Should we do IVM or in vitro maturation? If they need to start in a couple of days, we can immediately do the, the, the retrieval or uh, do an, uh, an ovariectomy, an exectomy, if uh, necessary. This is a meta-analysis of 10 uh, studies. They're important to mention that there was no RCT for obvious uh, reasons in this uh, in this setting, but you can see that whether there is a follicular start or a luteal a random start, that there was no um, uh, differences in terms of number of retrieved oocytes. So interesting study. Of course, there is a bit of a lack of long-term data. And this is what we will uh, always uh, have because I was recently in uh, in Antalya and there they also were asking me, yeah, so are you doing this in, in a routine base? Well, the honest answer is no, we are still not using uh, the random start. Yeah. This is a study that, that we did, uh, that we urgently need to uh, uh well to submit it says submitted but uh, it should be submitted uh, very very soon day two versus day 12 recombinant fsh in two arms and in the study arm there was a in the protocol there was an antagonist foreseen in case of lh levels that were increasing from let's say day six of the stimulation onwards and what we observed in this uh, rct that we actually presented uh, last year at uh, at Eshre was that um, we observed no differences mature oocytes um, um, number of days of stimulation was exactly the same in oocyte donors rct Oocyte donors, so not a crossover design. It was just an, uh, a randomized uh, study. But what was the more important observation? That the days of GnRH antagonist in the study arm was practically zero. We actually used it in only one uh, patient because of the LH that was more or less rising, let's say. And then, of course, the cost of the medication. The cost of the medication was significantly reduced because we do not need any antagonist uh, anymore. So interesting findings with this um, uh, study. What about our low responder patients or poor responders? Well, yes, we do have data and it is uh, Joaquin uh, Liasser from, uh, from Spain who published that uh, a couple of years ago he said, well, let us have a look in the early follicular start versus the uh, luteal start four days after LH peak to start, uh, or, uh, to start with the FSH in a GNRH antagonist protocol, in a flexible antagonist protocol. And he also did not observe any difference in terms of days of stimulation, in terms of of number of oocytes. We are talking about low responder patients, so 2.6, 2.1 uh, oocytes in both arms. Again, there is a lack 
of uh, uh, clinical uh, outcome data, we are talking about a very small uh, sample size, ladies and gentlemen. So the implications for clinical practice, yes, this is the question. We do not completely uh, feel uh, ready uh, to do this in this category of patients, let's see what it will give. Because the major issue is, of course, what about impacts on live birth rates? And luteal phase stimulation, of course, again, when there is a couple of studies, we have a meta-analysis. And this meta-analysis did not uh, show any difference in uh, in terms of, of O sites, consumption of FSH, and so on, but only a couple of studies, only four uh, studies, and look at, at the uh, number of events, a very low number of events in all of these uh, uh, trials, except for the last one, but there it is um, stated that there was no uh, impact on live birth rates. I think it is too early to um, confirm this uh, meta-analysis before we can state that live birth rate is not hindered by luteal phase stimulation, we need at least more, more data. So this is, uh, this is it a bit. With regard to innovative treatment protocols, with regard to freeze-all uh, strategy, but we need to look at our children. Ladies and gentlemen, if we would be in Denmark today, if we would be listening to Anja Pinborg today, she would say, Christoph, freeze all for all. Never. Freeze all is an add on. Let's use freeze all when it is necessary and go for the fresh because of our children. We know that the large for gestational age babies are increased when using a frozen embryo transfer. We know that there is more microsomia when using frozen embryo transfer. We know that there is more, more post-term post -term, uh, birth when using frozen embryo transfer. We need to take that into account. And of course, these studies, these large cohorts from uh, the Scandinavian countries from the so-called CONARTAS uh, group. They, they have a, a huge uh, registry, of course, with all the data. They can retrieve a lot of uh, data. For example, also, they observed an increased um, uh, incidence of hypertensive disorders of preeclampsia in the frozen cycles as compared with the fresh. Of course, again, look at the at the dates eh? 12 13 14 most of them are slow freezing protocols that's one and then secondly at that time um, they did a lot of hrt cycles today scandinavian countries they will not use any hrt preparations anymore for frozen cycles but there again it needs our attention in the freeze all that we will have more hypertensive disorders during pregnancy and more hypertensive, uh, more gestational age, large for gestational age babies in frozen cycles as well. And of course, this is something else. This, of course, was caught by the media, more cancer in frozen embryo transfer cycles. <gasps> the whole world was, of course, silent when they saw this paper appearing. And although we need to be very cautious uh, in interpreting these data because we are talking about extremely low, fortunately, extremely low numbers here, but it was uh, um, a study that uh, a cancer was more prevalent and then specifically le leukemia uh, was more uh, present in the frozen embryo transfers as compared with fresh. Do we need to panic? Far from there. Let's uh, put this paper into perspective. Let's look at the, the shortcomings, at the heterogeneity of the, the different studies in, uh, included, but at least we need to um, uh, be cautious with the, with the results. So, as to conclude, yes, freeze-all is hot, and let's use freeze-all for patients. We, in our center, we use a freeze-all strategy in around 30% of the cycles. It is 
climbing, it is increasing. And you know that today in the era of uh, PGTA, PGTA, PGT 2.0, PGT 3.0, when the PPOS uh, protocol and so on, so there will be more and more freeze-all. It offers a lot of possibilities for both patients and, of course, doctors and in the lab, also for innovative protocols. But freeze-all for all is maybe not the way forward. Thank you very much for your attention.